talked about the Cuban influx and this wave of players from Cespedes and Abreu and Puig on down. And according to Joel Sherman, there is another one out there lurking. And maybe Yoan Moncada, Joel, is the best of them all. Could it be that he could end up a better talent, a bigger talent than that aforementioned group? Well, Major League teams are in bidding right now because they believe that. And isn't our offseason all about next now? James Shields is done, and now we're already on to next. And that's Moncada. Uh, executives who I spoke to in the last 24, 48 hours expect that this deal will be done sooner than later, probably by the end of this week, that Moncada would like to be part of spring training. How talented is he? Well, just as a physical talent, one of the teams that I believe is in deep for him said that if Yohan Moncada was born in the United States, he's such a fast, built big uh, athlete that he'd be playing middle linebacker for Alabama right now at 19. <laughs> So that's the kind of athlete, you see why teams are excited. But the feeling, Matt, is he's going to end up with a big market team. And why? Well, he's kind of unique. He's 19. So he falls under the provisions of uh, the bonus pool. So he's going to get a bonus. Is it 20 million, 30 million, 40 million? Whatever it is, that bonus has to be paid relatively quickly. The longest you could stretch it out is three years. So you have to have money on hand. Also, any team that signs him is going to go over the pool provision for this. And that money has to be sent to the commissioner's office by July 2nd, the beginning of the international signing period. So, for example, if you're already fully over and you have to pay 100% and you give Moncada a $30 million signing bonus, you have to write a check separate to the commissioner's office for $30 million by July 2nd. So it's got to be a team with that kind of cash flow. And why would big market teams be interested? The feeling is maybe there's a little bit of breathless hype as there usually is on international players, but and, and everyone's saying he'd be the number one pick in the draft. Would he be the number one? I don't know, but everyone says he'd be a top 10, top 15 pick. And teams that are big markets, Yankees, Red Sox, Giants, watch out for the Giants, I keep hearing them, Dodgers, they're teams that don't generally have access to a top 10 draft pick. So how much would they be willing to spend for a player like this? Ask this question, if Chris Bryant were made a free agent today, or Brian Buxton, uh, how much would a team sign him for? Should he be compared to that? Or should he be compared to other Cubans? Well, other Cubans, a guy like Jose Abreu, went directly to the major leagues. Mancada, 19, almost certainly has to start in the minor leagues, maybe as low as A. So does he get compared to Yasiel Puig, who had a start in the minor leagues? That was seven years of 42 million. But again, remember, it was seven years of 42 million. That was a major league contract. Mancata, it just gets a bonus, and then he begins to be paid like any other player. He'll be an arbitration player after three years, free agency after six in the major league. So this is a big money deal, and teams are trying to figure out how to pay him. Interesting uh, th comps there, talking about if Bryant were a free agent available right now. And I, and I like the point about teams like the Giants not usually having access to top ten draft picks. This is their chance to go out and sign one of, that, uh, one of those types of talents right now. So we'll continue monitoring that situation. But the watch is off on James Shields. Uh, yet another production element that gets scrapped here at MLB Network. In fact, we should just look at that one more time for old time's sake. So the four-year deal that, that lands him in San Diego was the end of a negotiating road that had many twists and turns, Joel, and many familiar faces all along the way. Yeah, I'll say this is obviously there's a lot to this and a lot will come out at the end. Where did it start? Where did it end? At the winter meetings, teams were saying he was at five years and looking for as much as 125 million. He ended up at four years in the 72 to 78 million dollar range. But what I find interesting is remember, Shields is a guy who in the last seven years of his career was a key player on a small market team that had a winning record. The last seven teams he was on average 91 wins. The Padres are kind of going for it now. And think it's the Padres and probably the three other teams that were in it at the end all had someone who knew James Shields which speaks well to James Shields, that they wanted him back, that he's good for a team. The Dodgers were in at the end. Andrew Friedman is running their baseball operations. He was the general manager for Tampa Bay. The Marlins were in late. Dan Jennings is their general manager. He was the scouting director in 2002 who drafted uh, Shields for the, for the Rays. And the Cubs were in late. Their manager, Joe Madden manage shields with the Rays. So these were teams that were interested if the dollar figure was right in reuniting with them, 
And I don't think they want to reunite with someone they don't think would be good for their team and their clubhouse. So I think it says something positive about James Shields late here in the process. Here's how crazy it is uh, where we are financially right now. And I'm, I'm doing this kind of on the fly here, remembering what we had talked about during a commercial break with Keith Costas. And, Joel, you were in on this as well. Uh, the Padres offer and, and sign Jake Peavy to an extension after he had won a Cy Young Award there, which I believe was four years, $52 million, which was a huge bite down for San Diego at the time. Now they're in the open market, and they're writing checks for players that haven't been there before, that are older, that don't have a Cy Young Award in their closet, that's James Shields, for four years, $75 million. It wasn't that long ago that the Padres had stepped out on that PV deal. We thought it was crazy back then because they didn't do that sort of thing, and now they're doing it for a guy that doesn't have the franchise track record that PV did. Uh, absolutely, and you know what it says to me, Matt, is once you go in, you've got to stay in. And so they got hyper-aggressive this offseason under their new general manager, A.J. Preller, right? They do Kemp, they do Upton, they do Myers, they redo their outfield, they end up with Will Myers, they end up with Derek Norris, and they're probably taking a look around and saying, are we good enough to win? And I kind of always compare it to when you play poker. At some point, you have so much money in the middle of the pot that you're kind of compelled to look at the last card or two in a draw so that your money doesn't go to waste. At least you're taking a shot at it. And I feel like they decided to do this. And I would figure if they're close in July, that they'll be aggressive in the June-July sweepstakes in the trade deadline also. And there will be some chips to play with there as well with uh, guys like Ian Kennedy in a walk here. Joel Sherman, the latest on the, uh, the James Shields contract.